Beautiful. All right. Good morning, everyone. That spotlight is like right there. That's awesome. Nothing helps you wake up better than a spotlight and a room full of great people. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, this is our, again, saying first annual feels funny, right? Like this is something that we want to do every year. And I'm going to take a moment to explain that. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Guy Atragasso, President and CEO of your Bellingham Regional Chamber of Commerce. And thanks for being here. Thanks for taking a little bit of your time, a little bit of your morning to educate yourself, connect with each other, uh, and make this community a little bit better. So most of you, many of you, are aware of this brand that you see. Bellingham Chamber Speaker Series. And this is a brand that we have had for decades. It predates me being here with the organization. And it's an opportunity that we take to showcase and engage with primarily local leaders, but generally high value topics. And Sarah and I and our team and our board were pondering, it's like, gosh, what's missing as part of this portfolio of our speaker series? and education. For a few years now, I have, again, for those of you who are familiar with chambers, who've seen other chambers, you have probably heard this narrative, to create a place to live, work, and play. At nauseum, every community says it. But probably about five years ago, I started, I changed it. I added a word, because if you know me, you know I love words. As I'm going well beyond my like, keep it to two minutes. Um, live, learn, work, and play. Like we're so blessed and lucky and privileged to have some amazing educational institutions. And all of us as business people know that there is constant learning. You always have to innovate and you always have to learn what those new technologies are. So let's lean in to the education pieces. And we have some great educational institutions here in this community. And even deeper than that, recently our board uh, went through a visioning process, right? Create a vision, a new mission statement, and then essentially three core strategies. Advocate, most of you see us do that on a regular basis. Connect, we do that really well, and you were doing that really well as we facilitate this meeting, and any time the chamber engages is a great chance to connect. But the third one is a new word for us, and it's cultivate. And cultivate gets to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different industries and people and members. And deeply rooted in that cultivation is a workforce engagement. And we do that, and we can do that, and we get to do that through deep connection with our education institutions. And so that's why we're here today. And so we hope to be able to partner with our um, educators and our institutions for years to come while we continue to bridge that gap or deepen the bridge, because in some instances there is no gap, but deepen that connection between our employers and our education, our educational institutions. So thank you for being what's going to be the first annual Chamber Speaker Series State of Education. Um, so we would not have these events if it weren't for our sponsors. And we're so fortunate to have Veritas be uh, this year's series presenting sponsor. And we are lucky enough to have Veritas at I think at almost every one of our events, again, to make us sound and look good. And so Josh is not able to be here this morning. He is traveling. Uh, so I think we have a little brief message, maybe from Josh. I don't know. I haven't even seen it yet.
Awesome. Again, round of applause for the Veritas team. I was kind of hoping we'd see Josh, like his little face up there, all cute and all. Um, so, moving on. A um, little bit of a housekeeping, again, for those of you that have attended our speaker series events, you kind of know the drill. So on the middle, we have a number of little paper products, um, but you will see a Q&A card. And so we never, the microphone never leaves right here. So if you have a question, please write it down, um, and then we'll collect those. Um, momentarily, we're gonna have Heather Steele uh, come on up to kind of give the first presentation, and we're gonna do a little Q&A session if any of you have specific questions for her directly after hers, and then we'll get on to the other speakers. So, I don't see anybody reaching for a little note card, so that's great. Um, so without further ado, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, and welcome Heather Steele, CTE, and for those, and you, those of you who know me, I do not love acronyms, Career Technical Education, uh, CTE Director at Belling Bellingham Public Schools to the podium. So Heather, come on up. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for, being, for um, being here today. It's a privilege to be speaking to you about something that plays a critical role in shaping the future of both our students and our workforce, career and technical education, or otherwise known as CTE. For me personally, CTE isn't just about education. It's about opportunity, empowerment, and the future of our workforce. As a previous high school CTE teacher, assistant principal, and now director, I have seen firsthand how CTE programs could help a student who might feel uncertain about their path and give them the tools, the confidence, and the skills they need to excel in both the classroom and in their careers. Seeing students light up when they discovered their passion and realized that school could directly lead to a career was life-changing for me and had a profound impact on them as well. CTP, CTE provides that pathway for so many of our students. It shows them that there are multiple routes to success after high school. So whether you are a parent, an educator, a business leader, or a member of our community, your involvement in CTE definitely matters. Today I'm gonna to be covering a few key points, what exactly CTE is, how it contributes to our workforce, some of the challenges we face, and the opportunities that are on the horizon. Most importantly though, I'm gonna share how all of us can contribute to the success of these programs. So I'd like to start by exploring what CTE is all about. Career and technical education is a modern approach to education that is deeply connected to the realities of the workforce. While traditional education has long focused on broad academic subjects, CTE goes a step further by offering programs specifically designed to prepare our students for the careers that they want to pursue. These programs give students the technical skills and the hands-on experience that they need to thrive in today's market. For example, in our CTE programs, students aren't just learning theory. They're applying what they learn directly to real-world problems. In an automotive technology class, you're gonna see students repairing engines, not just learning about engines. In healthcare CTE programs, students don't just study autonomy or at anatomy, <laughs> they practice <laughs> taking vital signs and administering um, basic patient care while under supervision. And in our construction trades programs, students don't just learn about building structures, they're actively measuring, cutting, and building to create real world projects. This hands-on learning is the core aspect of what makes CTE so effective. And the beauty of CTE is in its flexibility. Whether a student wants to go directly into a career after high school, pursue further education like a two or four year degree, or gain certifications and apprenticeships, our CTE programs offer pathways to all of those options. It's a bridge between academic learning and the world of work, and it's making a real difference in the lives of our students. 
In our county, we have a wide array of CTE programs, from healthcare to IT, to construction to culinary arts. Our students have access to diverse fields and the, those that cater to their interests and their strengths. <clears throat> We've also worked hard to ensure that these programs are accessible to all of our students, including those in special education. We have developed key partnerships and job coaching initiatives to make sure that these students, those with abilities that need additional support, are well supported and are able to gain the skills that they need for success. These partnerships have been a game changer and they're allowing our students who may have previously been left out of career readiness programs to fully participate and thrive. But what really sets CTE apart is its close alignment with industry needs. We are not just teaching students what we think they should know. We're working with local businesses, industry leaders, and post-secondary institutions, all of you here today, to ensure that our curriculum reflects what employers are actually looking for. This connection to the real world is what makes CTE so valuable, not just to students, but to our local economy as well. I'd like to dive deeper into the role CTE plays in workforce development. It's no secret that industries across the board are facing a skills gap. Employers are finding it harder to recruit workers who are job ready and possess the technical skills needed to thrive in today's rapidly evolving workplace. This is where CTE comes in, as it directly addresses the gap by preparing our students with the skills that employers are actively seeking. Take for instance the healthcare sector, one of the fastest growing industries in the nation. The demand for skilled healthcare professionals from medical assistants to lab technicians and nurses, it is absolutely skyrocketing. CTE programs can help meet that demand by preparing students for these high growth fields through focused hands-on learning. Graduates from healthcare related CTE programs don't just leave school with a diploma, they also have the opportunity to earn certifications that make them job ready from day one. And it's not just healthcare. CTE programs across IT, the trades, and other high demand sectors are having the same impact. They're helping our students gain the credentials and the experience that they need to secure well-paying jobs. For students, CTE offers immense benefits. It helps them achieve job readiness before they even graduate from high school. With soft skills and credentials in hand, our students can walk into a job interview and demonstrate that they have both the knowledge and the practical skills needed for the role. And beyond job readiness, CTE programs instill a sense of adaptability in our students. In today's world where technologies and industries are constantly evolving, the ability to adapt is crucial. Our CTE pre programs teach students how to think critically, how to solve problems, and how to work in team environments. And those are skills that will serve them well no matter where their career takes them. Additionally, the impact of CTE extends beyond individual students. The economic impact can be profound. By producing a workforce that is equipped to meet the, lead, the needs of local industries, CTE directly contributes to a thriving community. Employers benefit from having a pool of skilled workers, which allows them to grow their businesses and meet the demands of their customers. And when local industries thrive, so does our local economy. More jobs mean more economic growth, and it's all connected to the foundation that CTE can provide. So as valuable as CTE is, <clears throat> it is not without challenges. The first challenge I wanna talk about is fiscal uncertainty. Like many programs in education, CTE does face limitations when it comes to funding. Our programs require state-of-the-art equipment, well-trained educators, and resources to um, support program expansion. However, with budget constraints, it can be difficult to secure the necessary funds. This can impact our ability to offer the highest quality experiences for our students, and it's an ongoing issue that we continue to address. Another significant challenge is equity and access. And while we've made great strides in ensuring that CTE is accessible to all students, we still face hurdles when it comes to providing equal opportunities, particularly for students in underserved communities and those with special needs. So it's critical that we continue to find ways to support every student, regardless of their background or their circumstance, so that they can benefit from the opportunities that CTE can provide. And finally, there's the challenge of staying current with industry needs. As you all know, 
Industries are evolving faster than ever, and technologies are advancing at a rapid pace, and it can be difficult for our programs to keep up. If we want to prepare our students for the future, we need to ensure that our programs are aligned with industry trends and technologies. This requires ongoing collaboration with industries and continuous improvement in our curriculum, our equipment, and our teaching methods. But along with these challenges also come some awesome opportunities. One of the biggest opportunities is the potential to expand partnerships with you, our community. These partnerships can provide invaluable experiences for students, giving them a chance to apply what they're learning in the classroom into real world settings. They can also help businesses develop a pipeline for future employees who are well trained and ready to hit the ground running. Another opportunity lies in the innovation happening in CTE teaching. New technologies, tools, and techniques are transforming the way that our students learn. From virtual simulations to advanced manufacturing tools, the future of CTE education is bright, and we really have the chance to lead the way in integrating these innovations into our classrooms. And finally, by strengthening our collaborations with post-secondary institutions, we can create more seamless transitions for our students who want to continue their education. Articulation agreements, dual enrollment programs, and, and, pa and stronger pathways to, to community colleges and universities are all ways that we can support students who want to build on their CTE experience with further education. So you might be wondering how you can help. There are so many ways for our com um, community members to contribute to the success of our CTE programs. First and foremost, engagements with our schools is critical. <clears throat> We're always looking for guest speakers, professionals who can come into our classrooms and share their experiences with our students. Facility tours are another fantastic way to expose our students to different industries and careers. And if you have the ability to mentor students, even offering guidance or sharing your own career story, that can have a lasting impact. If you're a business owner or involved with a local company, you can help by offering internships, donating equipment, or even providing direct funding to our programs. These partnerships are the backbone of our CTE program success, and they help ensure that our students are getting real world relevant experiences. Advocacy is another key piece, and raising awareness about the importance of CTE is paramount, especially when it comes to securing the funding we need to grow and sustain our programs. I encourage you to talk to local and state officials, spread the word about the positive impact CTE is having on our community, and support funding initiatives that will keep our programs strong for years to come. So as I wrap up, <clears throat> I want to leave you with a few key takeaways. Career and technical education is essential, not just for our students, but for our local economy as well. It's preparing our students for in-demand careers, it's closing the skills gap, and it's providing the workforce our industries need to thrive. But there are challenges, funding, equity, and staying current that we must continue to address. The good news is that we can overcome these challenges with the support of our community. You have the power to make a difference, whether it's through advocacy, partnerships, or in direct involvement in our schools. So I hope we can work together to ensure that CTE continues to be a pathway for success for all of our students. So I thank you for your time today. Your support means so much, and I'm confident together that together we can make a lasting impact. On your tables, you'll see some information about an upcoming event we're hosting in the school district in January. And if you're interested, I invite you to join us um, for our Design Your Future event. This is where middle school and high school students and families will be able to explore career pathways and hear from industry for prof professionals. So I look forward to collaborating with you all in the future, and I thank you for your time. Am I good to grab this mic here? Okay. All right. Maybe. There we go. All right. So just so the video can pick up, I'm not going to read it from the audience. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so one of the questions, I think you answered, but I want to acknowledge the question. Uh -huh. How does the business community deepen the connection 
with CTE, both from advocacy and programmatic? I think if you back up two slides, that answers back that question, up two right? Two slides, let's see. Yeah, really. Um, yeah, that one. Yeah. So definitely right there. engaging with our schools. Um, we're always looking for people to come in and talk to our students. I'm a real strong believer that the more people we get in front of our students, the more experiences that we provide for our students, eventually they're going to see themselves there. And once they make that connection, that's really what drives them to really find that passion that they've been looking for. So that's really important, just involvement and in sharing your skills and your talents with our students. Okay, next question, um, kind of a joint question, so I'll read okay. both. What role do you think entrepreneurship education can play in CTE, and how are these decisions made regarding investments in future programs and focus? Yeah, entrepreneurship is um, a great pathway for a lot of our students, and we have, um, they're called career and technical student organizations, or CTSOs, so we have students involved in DECA and FBLA, um, other programs that are really challenging students to think outside the box, um, create their own programs, their own marketing pieces. Um, they're able to go to competitions and practice their um, newly found skills. And just encouragement for them to explore and try lots of different things so that they can find what fits. When I think about the programs that we offer at the high school level, um, we really encourage our students to explore as many opportunities as they can. It's just as important for a student to find something out that they don't like something as it is for them to find out that they have a passion in an area. I think that answered the question enough. Okay. okay, next question. What are the enrollment trends for CTE students in Bellingham? Yeah, CTE um, enrollment continues to increase. We definitely saw an increase when we switched from our six period day to our eight period day because that offered more elective opportunities for students. Um, and we continue to add courses to our repertoire of classes that students can um, select from. We offer um, courses in six different program areas, um, environmental or ag agricultural sciences, um, business and marketing, Family and consumer sciences, health sciences, skilled and technical sciences, and STEM. So we probably have 50 to 60 courses that students at the high school level can pick from, and we're expanding the amount of CTE courses available at the middle school so students can start exploration there as well. All right, final question. What are some examples of certificates CTE students can earn while still in high school? Great question. So. Um, Right now, all of our students that are involved in our health classes or our sports medicine classes are getting their CPR and first aid certification. Students that are involved in our culinary classes, um, our student stores are getting their food workers um, cards. So those are all things that we pay for, we help the students get. Looks great on a resume that they already have that certification. Um, additional ones that students can get in some of our technical classes are Microsoft Office specialist certifications by demonstrating the skills in Microsoft Office. Um, we try to align all of our programs with some sort of industry recognized credential so that students are seeing the connection that the class has with industry. Awesome. How about a round of applause, right. Heather Steele? Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Heather, again. And kind of speaking to the deepening of that connection, um, Heather is an active volunteer. Uh, with the chamber, and so we certainly appreciate that. And I'm, I hope I don't miss anybody, but I know Lance and myself are both on the Bellingham CTE Advisory Committee. And again, part of all of this is just to deepen that connection between our local workforce and our educational institutions. So uh, thanks so much for your partnership, and thanks for being here this morning. So uh, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, President of Western Washington University, President Sabah Randawa, uh, to the stage. And I hope I said your last name right. You did it great. Okay. <laughs> Most people know I say mine wrong, so. Thank you so much, um, Guy, and good morning. Well, it's great to be here with you this morning, um, as well as with Superintendent Baker and Heather from the Bellingham Public Schools. Thanks for the Chamber for hosting this education event. Um, 
It's a pleasure to have some time with you this morning and, and give you a little few updates about Western and what's going on and where we are headed. So as I think about Western's impact here in Bellingham and in our region, I would be remiss not to mention a few of the ways the university contributes to the region from an economic perspective. As you know, many of you know, Western is the third largest employee in Whatcom County. We have over 2,000 employees. Our economic impact in Whatcom County is about 550 million a year. Statewide, it's about 1.2 billion a year. So, you know, we are proud of the impact we have in the region. Um, we partner um, with the city and the downtown Bellingham partnerships on various events and promotions aimed at encouraging Western students to support local businesses. We contract with as many local businesses as we can. We host a local industry career fair connecting local businesses and industry with students in an effort to keep our talent here in the community when students graduate. We house the local small business development center that many of you may be familiar with, one of the largest in the state, serving more than 300 businesses in Whatcom County every year. Um, uh, the SPDC, the Small Business Development Center, played a really important role in the disaster relief program. Um, and, uh, and its current work is really focused on extending, among other things, extending its reach to minority owners. So we are really proud of the work that they do. Um, so um, we are really proud of the relationships we have, and I can talk more about that. Um, but as an educational institution, of course, Western's most important area of impa impact is ensuring access to affordable and high quality post-secondary education. And as Guy said really at the start uh, introduction in his comments, we really are here to cultivate the future generation of citizens and leaders. And that's the, the most uh, critical role that we play um, in the community and in our state. Last week, last fr uh, Thursday, I should say, our Board of Trustees hosted leadership from Washington Roundtable. And if you are not familiar with the Washington Roundtable Group, um, it's a collection of major private sector employers in the state who work together on public policy issues, including higher education. The Roundtable has been a leader in highlighting the fact that the state's future workforce demands will require that many more Washingtonians have a post-secondary credential. In fact, the roundtable um, initially conceived the notion of the 70% attainment goal that the legislature later adopted, mean, essentially meaning that 70% of adults need to have a post-secondary credential by, I think, by 2030. Originally, the goal was by 2025. Um, anyhow, where I was getting with all this was that the roundtable just published a new statewide workforce analysis report that shows that over the next 10 years, Washington will see an estimated 1.5 million job openings. And that is both from retirements as well as the growth in economy, um, new jobs that will be added, added in the state. That 75% of this a million and a half um, jobs will require a post-secondary post credential of some kind. And bachelor's and advanced degree are projected to, uh, for almost 50% of the job openings. The roundtable report also shows that the state currently, or you know, based on these projections, faces a shortfall of nearly 600,000 of those jobs, even now taking into account all the graduates that, that publics and privates and community college CTC system is producing. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, almost 50% of those, that gap is going to be in jobs that are bachelors or higher. Now, in many ways, that really bodes well for the state that, you know, as, as, a, as an economic engine, the state is doing really well. In fact, um, you know, we're really proud that the state of Washington's uh, economic and innovation position in the nation, we are first in, uh, if you look at a 10-year period between, say, 2012 and 2022, we are first in GDP growth. We are fourth in GDP per capita among all states in the nation. We are ninth in, in, in job growth over the same time period. 
At the same time, uh, what is really sobering is that currently only about half of the students here in our state who graduate from Washington high schools pursue post-secondary education of any kind, and even fewer are projected to complete a degree or a certificate program. And so from that perspective, the, the CDE program, Heather, you were talking about, really becomes even more important in terms of how we connect students with, 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 uh, you know, with, with a meaning in terms of, of uh, post-secondary education. I think it is safe to say that we are facing a serious educational attainment problem in our state that really is an economic imperative if Washington is to, is to continue in terms of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the economic and the innovation that it has fostered over the, over the past few decades. So this is the challenge that is guiding the strategic direction of Western right now. This fall, we welcome just over 3,000 new first-year students to our campus, and this is the third year in a row that we have had over 3,000 students on campus. Um, you may have seen the report released uh, yesterday in the local papers um, that our enrollment now about 14,700. This is the first time our enrollment grew after the pandemic. Um, so we are really glad about that, uh, from that from that perspective. We still are, have with us the two low uh, pandemic year enrollment classes. We lost almost oh, about 1,100 or so students in the two years, 2020 and 2021. And uh, if you plot it out and students take five to six years to graduate, it takes five to six years for that low enrollment class to get through the system um, before the over overall enrollment um, really gets back to where we would like it to be which is around 16,000 students. Um, so in the next few years, um, as a means to helping to reach our state workforce targets and to ensure that more Washingtonians complete a four-year degree, our, our goal is to get to at least 3,200 first-year students each year, in addition to transfer students, about 1,000 students or so, transfer students from, from the CDC system. Um, and as I said, you know, eventually to get back and exceed the enrollment target of 16,000 that we are looking at. You know, we just don't want to be a diploma mill. We want to make sure that Western remains an excellent academic institution and we can really protect the, the quality brand of the institution. Um, at the same time, we have more work to do intentionally to reach out and recruit students in our region who have been traditionally underrepresented in higher education. Um, that's the work that we really are putting a lot of effort in. Um, just to give you a few examples of what we are trying to do here, um, we are increasing partnerships with community colleges to boost um, our transfer rates and achieve a more seamless and healthy higher education ecosystem. Um, Whatcom, Community College, Bellingham Technical College, um, Skagit Valley College are really critical partners in this particular activity, and we want to make sure that collectively we address the access and success um, opportunities for our students in the region. Um, we have a guaranteed admission program um, to high school students with GPU of 3.0 or higher who have completed minimum, ad, minimum admission course requirements, admitted, no question asked. Uh, we are also trying a pilot with, with uh, <clears throat> Ferndale in Mount Vernon on a 2.75 and what type of support that students in that gap would need for them to be successful. Um, so we are trying some new things. This year we started offering college and the high school courses, um, which is essentially a du dual credit program that um, where students receive both high school and college credit for classes in the high school. Um, we have not done it in the past. We are looking forward to expanding it in the coming year. Um, you know, again, it's a program where we can have students really um, uh, not just to take college degree and get a flavor of what, what, what four-year education looks like, but it also cuts down on their, on their time to graduation if they have some credits before coming into the university. We are, in addition to our focus on outreach, we continue to, fo to work on providing students with hands-on learning experiences that involve community partners. 
Um, we, we continue to have great partnership with regional industry uh, leaders like PACAR and BP. Our students have local internship with accounting firms, cities, tech firms, design firms, nonprofits, peace health, physical therapy clinics, to name a few. Um, students from, from our urban planning department are helping local governments like the cities of Ferndale, Bellingham, and Granite Falls with, with several planning projects. And of course, we have an invaluable partnership with our public school system, um, our Bellingham Public Schools. It's a, you know, it's a continuum. Um, and uh, we have our students in the classroom all around the county every day supporting classrooms and through our um, communities, leaders, uh, communities, children while learning the skills needed to teach. Last week, we hosted about 850 fifth graders on campus uh, from 13 schools from Whatcom County and um, Skagit County as part of our Compass to Campus peer mentoring program. And the focus here is on Title I programs to, to, to opening doors um, so people can, our student, young kids can see themselves in a college, can see the future. Um, uh, it's, it's been a great program and we, um, in fact, are looking forward how to expand the program and its, and its impact as we move forward. So let me um, just uh, uh, close by um, noting a couple of more cultural type of activities that we are involved in. Um, Western partners with 10 community partners, including the city of Bellingham, Bellingham Public Schools, Whatcom Community College, Northwest Indian College, to offer some of our um, community's key, key cultural events like the Martin um, Luther King Ju Junior Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, the Asian Pacific Islander, they see American Heritage Month um, and, and you know, several other activities. Um, we appreciate our partnership with the city and downtown Bellingham um, um, part, uh, groups to offer Western, Western Wednesday first night out um, and where we had about a thousand students support dozen of businesses at the start of the school year. Um, so we're really looking to expand those partnerships. So in conclusion, um, let me give you a couple of takeaways. Um, our vision is um, going forward is, is really to create an institution that is an active player in, a, in helping the state meet the 70% attainment goal that I referred to earlier. Um, if you were to ask me where I would like to see Western 10 years out, I would say writ large, not just Bellingham, but as you may know, we have operations in Everett. We are really expanding our work on the peninsulas in Kitsap and Olympic Peninsula. So writ large, I would like to see a university of about 20,000 students with about 17 to 17, five here on the main campus and then the others in, in, in other places. Um, I would like to see um, our, our um, retention and Graduation rates are only second to the University of Washington, not just in the state, but in the broader Northwest region, uh, which is really phenomenal, and because we have a lot of research, um, land grant, comprehensive universities, um, it's about 80% retention and 70% graduation, and I'd like to see those uh, to be at least 85 and 75. Um, and compared to UW, which is a very selective institution that admits only one in two students, we admit almost 90% of the students that apply. So it's even more, more impressive in that context. And then, you know, our three major um, uh, focus areas going forward is one, advancing inclusive student success, this notion of equity of access and equity of success increasing our impact in the state, both through our partnerships, as well as the work that our faculty do on research and outreach, and at the same time, um, really maintaining an excellent brand for the university that can make all of you in our community really proud in terms of what we have to offer in our region. We are always looking uh, for new ways to grow our impact in the community. We welcome your partnerships, and we would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you in terms of how we can deepen our partnership going forward, because our goals cannot really happen 
without deeper engagement with the community and making sure that the community is part of the university as we expand um, our programs, our impact. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me and um, uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue with you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have you have a seat, and then we'll call you back up uh, when Dr. Baker is done, and we'll do a Q&A. So at this time, I would like to welcome Superintendent of Bellingham Public Schools, Dr. Greg Baker, to the stage. And I, I mean, I'm going to put a special request into my friend here, Mr. Uh, Chris Roselli, one of the number of board members in the room. I think every graduate of the graduate school, not just the undergrad folks, graduate school, need one of those swinky WWU ties that <laughs> Sabah's got on. I'm just throwing that request out as an alum. If you so. Donated $1, you'd get the guy. Done. <laughs> you know, I don't, <laughs> well, invested a lot more than that. So, <laughs> so Dr. Baker, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm an alumni as well, so I'll take one of those ties. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's an honor to be here and um, follow um, a couple outstanding speakers and folks that care greatly about education. Um, so this morning, I'm gonna, my perspective is around one of our school districts in the county, Bellingham Public Schools, and what I'll share is certainly through our lens, but much of what I'll share is broader than just um, one school district. Um, but speaking of Bellingham, many of you are familiar with the Bellingham Promise, and I start there um, because it really is a document that if you haven't seen, you might want to look at that really is a collective statement from our community of what they expect of our K-12 um, part of um, education. And um, there's some real powerful statements in there, and you heard a lot of comments today that I think fit in there in terms of our vision and mission and having students find a passion and all students um, graduating prepared to, is for as many choices as they might want to make. You'll see on the 17 outcomes, um, this is the type of student, the characteristics that this community has said, these are the kind of kids we want, is a very whole child. It's not just about readers and writers and mathematicians, that's important, but it's about students who have good character, who are ready for broader the world, who are good communicators. Um, so this document, um, our, our strategic plan has grown over the years, but I'm proud of um, the stability of it um, and it changes as it needs to, but it's really guided our school district um, through these last few years, especially through hard years, as I mentioned, the pandemic and, and, and things that have happened, it's, uh, um, it's really helped us stay focused. One of the things I want to mention was talked a little about earlier about graduation rates, and I'm just going to share this kind of a celebration of um, a decade and a half um, that I've been here at least of some of the um, outcomes of the hard work and with the support of our community. What, the, what you're seeing here is um, the graduation rates of all students. And the important part probably is not the exact year, because that could go up and down, but look at the trend line. And that's what you want is an upward trend line. So for all of our students, we have an upward trend line. The piece that's underneath that is what about subgroups? And what about groups that, um, you know, making sure that all students are having access? So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but what you'll see here, this is students from low-income families that have challenges economically, um, how that trend line has gone up. Uh, our Hispanic and Latinx students, black and African-American students, multilingual learners, uh, what you might used to refer to as ELL students, students experiencing homelessness. We have a growing number of kids in our district. Um, our district, we have about um, 10,600 kids. Uh, we have um, six to 700 students that qualify for experiencing homelessness. That's a large number of students in our community experiencing homelessness. This one's an interesting one. This is students with disabilities, receive special education services. Um, at first glance, you can see it's some of our lowest graduation rates. Um, but what I'm gonna do is take you a level down. In our district, um, one of the things that we really do is emphasize our students that receive special education services. And, and by federal law, um, if you receive special education services, you don't have to graduate when you're 18. You can receive services all the way actually to your 22 now. And so 
um, if you look at a four-year graduation rate, we keep those students so they, they don't show up as graduates after four years. Um, we have a program called Community Transitions, which focuses on those students 18 to 22, and we're providing services to help better prepare them for what their next chapter is. And when you look at a graduation rate after seven years, you can see what that looks like. Um, so when you put all these together, um, what you'll see is um, our trajectory of all students, our graduation rates increasing, and then all those subgroups that we just went through, you want to have a, a higher, um, you know, your, your trend line um, going up faster. So I share that in the sense of uh, big picture. Um, I'm proud of the work that our school district has done to increase the graduation rates. I mentioned community transitions. This is, I'm going to share just a couple exciting things happening right now. We've been searching for um, a couple decades about how to serve those students 18 to 22. When I first got here, they were served um, in a portable out behind Bellingham High School, where Options High School was located, um, and that was okay. We brought them into Bellingham High School, and for the past decade or plus, they've been located at Bellingham High School, and that's been okay too, but these are 18 to 22-year-olds that would be better served with peers. So we've been searching uh, for a better answer, and this over the past couple years, we finally we landed on a, I think it's going to be an, an incredible partnership with Whatcom Community College, uh, where they're going to provide the land. Uh, the picture to the right, um, uh, you can maybe get a sense of where that is. There's a cruising coffee down to the bottom right, the foundation building there. And so they're going to provide the land, and I'm not plugging cruising coffee or anything, but that's where they are. To the left is our current sketch of a building that we're going to build on the community college's property. And then our students, 18 to 22-year-olds that receive special education services, will take classes there and then have access to higher ed in a way they'd never have before, as well as um, out to job sites uh, and learning job skills. So this is a really powerful example of partnership uh, in our community. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to just share is um, one of the challenges we're facing, and um, it's around uh, finance and budget. And those of you, many of you business leaders, homeowners, all of us are experiencing this. Right now in education, this is uh, probably the biggest fiscal challenge I've seen. Um, and I've, you know, we had the recession, uh, the pandemic, so we've had hard. This one is right up there in terms of uh, trying to figure out how we're going to get through it. Um, this is just an example of it's not a Bellingham problem, it's not just a Whatcom County, it's not just even actually the state of Washington. We're all trying to figure this out. But certainly in our school district, this is at the forefront, um, is the budget challenges. Um, and I, didn't, I don't mean to highlight Western here, but these are just some recent news clips that show the city, the county, the um, Western, we are all experiencing um, this. I want to remind uh, folks, uh, and those of you that have followed education will resonate with this, our state constitution is one of the strongest constitutions in the country focusing on education. In fact, it says the paramount duty of the state is to fund um, uh, education. And you might remember that the state got sued by a family a number of years ago because they weren't fully funding education, the McClary lawsuit. The state lost and the Supreme Court held the state of Washington in contempt for not doing that. The state made a number of changes, um, some of the, uh, very positive, but it didn't solve the whole thing, and we're starting to see evidence of the system needing some more action. Um, a reminder that uh, school finance is complicated. One of the questions I get asked the most is, like when budgets are tight and you're talking about needing to adjust class size or pull back on things, they're like, well, why don't you just take the dollars that you're doing to build great facilities and fix your problem there? And the, the short answer is we can't legally do that. It's a separate part of dollars. So we have bond dollars that can do building. We have levy dollars and state dollars that can program in people, and you can't mix the two. But that, that's also a, a frustrating thing. Like, if I could do that, I would, but um, can't. This is a couple charts I'm going to show you that come from the state superintendent's office that highlights some of the challenges we have. This is the percentage of our state, overall state funding that goes to K-12 education. And as you can see, it was um, at a high of 52%. So 52% of the state budget went to public education. 
And over the past few years, that's dropped to be projected around 44%. If the state just maintained that 52% going to public education, I don't think we would have, we, we would be in a much better place. So that's a, um, one of the challenges we face. This one has a lot of numbers to it, but um, this is K-12 spending by the state um, over a decade plus. And you'll see both the state revenue and local revenue is that darker band at the bottom. And what I often hear from legislators is around, we've increased funding for K-12 education over the past decade. And this shows that they're right. They, if this is the overall state spending in billions of dollars, they have increased. And you can see um, a big jump right around the McClurry decision in 1718. And so I think our legislators receive, um, should receive some acknowledgement for working hard to support, in this case, public education. So that's a positive, but the challenge, as we know, is if you adjust this for inflation, it flattens out. And inflation has really eaten up much of what the benefit would have has been by an increase in dollars. Another way that we talk about funding for education is per pupil funding. So I'm gonna take this same chart, but I'm gonna to add to it and take the total dollars to K-12 divided by the total number of kids, and you'll see we used to receive about $9,600, it peaked at around 12,500. That's where the McClurry decision comes in. And then we've actually been on a slow decline since when you account for inflation. Another one I wanna share is um, this number of $22 billion. And this one hasn't been on my radar much, but as I've been trying to understand why, why are we in this situation, um, our state um, sends money to the federal government the federal government makes their decision and then sends money back to states. We currently, as a state, um, get $22 billion back less than we send. Does that make sense? Um, so we're basically subsidizing other states, for good or for bad. Um, but when someone says, hey, there's not enough money in our state budget to do, in this case, I'd say public education, it could be higher education, it could be whatever, why, why, why don't we have enough money one place to examine, at least, is we send out to other states $22 billion of our money that's not coming back here. Um, and you know, this is more of a, at the DC level and our, national, our uh, federal legislators impact that. So it's just a good piece of data to know um, as we talk about the needs in our own state. Um, the inflation piece, I think this room is, you're pretty high expert on this, but I just want to share some examples for our school district. This is just showing one example. This is uh, our school district cost for utilities and insurance. And you can see that it was um, $3.7 million we spent um, back in the, the far left there. You can see that that blue line has gone up. So our costs, just like yours, have gone up. The orange line is how much we receive from the state to pay for utilities and insurance. And you can see that it's basically stayed flat. So we now um, projected uh, for uh, this year are going to are $3 million short to pay utilities and insurance from what we receive from the state. So what does a school district do when you have that? Um, the only place you can do is take from what you're what the state doesn't give us, our next biggest bucket, is our local levy. So we basically use our local levy to pay for this. And our local levy is capped by the legislature. So I don't get to come out to our community and say, hey, community, inflation has gone up. Our insurance costs have gone up by $3 million. The state's currently not funding it. So let's raise our local levy by $3 million. The legislature has capped us. So that means you have to cut program, cut people, in order to just pay insurance costs. And this is just one example of many, but I think it, it highlights that, that inflationary piece um, that, that we're all dealing with. So in terms of budget, just to wrap up that piece, um, what happens for us is we find out our budget um, a couple months before the new year starts, which is, makes it really challenging to plan ahead. We just had the state superintendent announce his budget proposal for education. Um, we then will in December hear the governor propose his budget for education, and then we'll have a new governor. So then that new governor will decide whether to follow what the current governor proposed or put their own proposals out. And then in January, the legislature comes into session and they finish sometime between April and June. I've seen them go as late as June. And we as school districts 
watch this happen and then they tell us what our revenue will be and then we, a few months later, we start a new fiscal year, but we have to make decisions before that. And so it's just a challenging uh, context to build a budget when you don't even know what your revenue uh, will be until a few months before. So all that to be said, um, uh, big picture, some wonderful things happening in, in education, in, our, in public education in our school district and some real challenges. But at the end of the day, our staff, and we have some of you who are married to staff in our district, they come to work each day and they work hard on behalf of, of our kids that are in our schools. A um, couple of kids uh, from the first day of school. Um, this is, uh, you've seen our new district office that again was supported by a bond, supported by our community. We have an early learning center uh, there at the uh, district office. So these are some of our kids, uh, which uh, just brings joy uh, as we go to work each day. So uh, with that, thank you for supporting public education and thank you for the invitation to be here today. President Rondawa can come up as well. Um, and again, I just want to acknowledge, Heather, please feel free to come on up as well. I'm going to acknowledge that Dr. Baker is Heather's boss. And that's a potentially a weird situation. So that's why we wanted to take questions for Heather. Let her say that. <laughs> um, we wanted to, and which is why we facilitated a couple questions with Heather, but you were more than welcome to be here. Um, <laughs> so, all righty. So a couple of questions regarding budget, which again were, were addressed, but I think, I mean, we, most of you mentioned a room full of business folks. They understand the inflationary pressures and budget shortfalls. And so I'm gonna read both of these questions, one of them is targeting higher education specifically, but I do think it speaks broadly. So first question, and I'll get through all of it first. How are higher ed institutions managing the additional initiatives in the midst of budget shortfalls and high turnover? Additionally, what percentage of school budget impacted by unfunded state mandates, or what are, what are the percentage of school budget impacted by unfunded mandates, and how important are these mandates in many cases to directly impact operating budgets? So. Well, I think uh, my colleague here really did a great job in terms of painting the overall budget picture at the state. And I deliberately didn't get into budgets in my comments, uh, even though it is a challenge, and because I wanted to really focus on, on possibilities and, and uh, you know, what is it that we are really trying to achieve. But of course, you know, budget is an important element in terms of driving many of those changes and in, in advancing our work at the university. Um, we, in fact, had a budget forum yesterday for our campus community. Um, and we talked about the headlines that, that, that uh, we shared in terms of how we are going to manage it. But just to step back from the whole thing, let me start off by saying that, you know, I, before coming here, I was with Oregon State University for almost 25 years. Um, and uh, I would say the last 15 years in, in central administration. Overall, it may be hard to believe, but, this, but, the, but the state of Washington is a lot more education friendly than Oregon was during my entire 25 years. So, um, I have particularly appreciated the work that the legislature has done around affordability. The, the, the Washington College Grant provides a wonderful opportunities for Washingtonians really to go to our institutions uh, with very little debt at the other end of the, of the pipeline. At the same time, uh, there are some interesting um, uh, structures here in the state of Washington that really disadvantages uh, education funding. And I think, Greg, you referred to them, a few of them. But the one I particularly want to mention is that in the state of Washington, there is no connection between students and funding. So there is nothing that stops me from capping enrollments at 10,000 tomorrow morning. There will be absolutely no consequences for state funding before or after. And so uh, while higher education budgets are complex because mission of each institutions are different and so on, 
What has happened is that Western's enrollment have grown over time. Even, even if you consider, even if you normalize it for pandemic, we have grown a lot more than, than other than the University of Washington, than any of the other institutions. But the funding, if you look at state funding for higher education institution per student FTE, Western is the lowest right now. We get about $9,000 per student from the state. Um, the highest is $22,000 for uh, for Evergreen, primarily because their enrollments have, are now about 2,000 students. And so one of the cases that we are trying to make in this legislative session, and it's a difficult session because the, the economic forecast is flat at best, um, is to adjust the base budget um, that, that is really linked with per student funding um, from that from that perspective, and, and as Greg said, you know the state typically does not fund inflation. It hasn't funded inflation since the Great Recession, um, for higher education at least. So if you if you if you if you compound those issues, the per state funding, inflation, and so on, um, there is a structural issue in terms of how the state approaches funding for higher education. I don't think it's going to get fixed in one um, in one legislative session. But what I'm really hopeful is that we can start a conversation with the, with the legislature and with the new governor coming in about how do we, how do we um, uh, fund higher education in the long term, which I hope in the long term would be of value. Uh, just the question, part of the question to me was around um, the unfunded mandate piece, right? like what percentage of our budget is for unfunded mandates. We don't categorize the dollars that way, so I don't have a percentage. Um, but where my mind goes is we do a whole lot of things that someone might argue are, are a mandate that aren't funded. And most of the time, we do that in the spirit of we're going to do whatever it takes to help the students and families be successful. So whether that's we spend resources on um, I mean, the pandemic was a good example on, on food, on trying to get families and kids food and shelter. Um, you know, those the 600 plus students that qualify for homelessness, we have staff that are working with those families to try to connect them to services to get them, uh, get the kids to school. Um, so our list of things that we do that are not funded by the state is immense, um, but we usually view it in the sense of we're going to do whatever it takes to help a family. and that. Like we're opening a health clinic at Options High School to serve our community, so we're providing health care services in a school. That's probably not our core mission is health care, but because the broader community, you know, does not provide enough services, we're we're working with partners uh, to do that. So we definitely are out of our lane, I think you could say, but that's what it takes to get to where this community wants of all kids to graduate and have a chance in life. So um, we. To, I'd like to go make a list of that, that it's long, I'm sure. If I can just add one other observation, just to give you a broader perspective, and Greg, your comment, in fact, reminded me of it. The university budget overall is around $375 million. If you take out um, housing and dining and research, you know, we really can't take the dollars and put it to something else, as you were saying, you know, they aren't fungible. The core education budget is about $240 million give or take. Uh, and it's exactly split 50-50 between tuition and state support. So what we are dealing with is uh, sort of a structural issue with the state in terms of funding for inflation and other increases, and the fact that we are down students from the pre-pandemic levels, so we have loss in, in tuition, and that's what's really causing um, the, uh, the, the, the changes we are trying to make uh, right now at the institution. And as Greg said, you know, um, universities weren't designed to provide, to take care of um, food insecurity or housing insecurity or serious mental health issues as the, the two students who committed, unfortunately, suicide, you know, the big news over the past week or so. But, you know, we are part of the bigger society and because of the lack of funding from other areas, part of our job is to do our very best we can to address those issues. And so that really does create some, you know, in the long term, some issues for the university in terms of how we balance these needs while delivering on the education mission. All right. Thank you all. We've got a lot of questions, and I'm looking at the time, and I'm like, we're going to get to a few of them. So uh, next question, 
how do we as a community support our students, both uh, the K-12 um, who are, I guess, functionally residents, and those in higher ed who may only be here for a few years. So what are ways that the community can support our students? Well, Sounds like you, you got so something to say. <laughs> no, I don't, but if you insist, I will. Um, well, you know, um, that's a great question, and I think each of us talked a little bit about our partnerships with the community. Um, because I think in part, those partnerships are critical to keeping the students here after they graduate. Um, I think a critical element for us as a community to address is the economic development in our community. Because we can only keep higher education, you know, students graduating from say Western um, or from Whatcom Community College or any of the other institutions here if there are jobs at the other end of the pipeline. And so I think part of our uh, mission, again, there was a question Heather, that, that you entertained about innovation. And in terms of how do we work our community to create a, a, a healthy, innovative economy in the region that will keep our students there. Um, you know, we have been, uh, over the time, you know, we have engaged in conversation around the Cascadia corridor between Portland and Vancouver and what role does this region play as economic opportunities increase between, you know, on this, on this, uh, on this grid. Um, so I think in the long term, that is really an important and critical question that we all need to come together and address in terms of how we, how we uh, embrace change and how we help develop the economic opportunities for our communities, because that would be a key driver in terms of, of ultimately keeping our students here. I thought that was an excellent answer. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, next question is probably more directed towards K-12. But uh, President Wendell, if you have comments, please feel free Rick to take this one. <laughs> Perfect. So talk to us about soft skills. So the business community often um, talks to me about a gap in soft skills for younger employers or younger employees. and so. What is the K-12 system doing to kind of meet that demand? Yeah, so a couple thoughts, and, and Heather, feel free if you have some reflections as well. Um, when, I out, when I pulled up the Bellingham Promise and talked about those 17 outcomes, um, you know, that's one place where we highlight soft skills, not just um, 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 the traditional things that you might think that we teach in public education. Um, and we work hard to, to talk about how we develop the whole child. Um, those of you that are parents, we send out evidence all the time, um, promise stories showing how we do that. Um, we have a fantastic school board in our district. They hold me and our staff accountable for those outcomes. We write reports every year um, demonstrating how we're making progress towards developing students with those 17 outcomes. And we use both quantitative data and qualitative data, meaning it's not always easy to just measure success when you're talking about developing human beings. So a lot of it is storytelling and how our staff and community are engaging our kids to make magical things happen. We've invested heavily, um, especially in the elementary years, around social emotional learning, um, how to help students um, think not just about, you know, read this book and answer questions, but how are you developing as a human being? How are you figuring out how to deal with trauma? How are you figuring out how to deal with conflict? Um, and we spend a lot of time developing um, kids so that when they do graduate, they're, they can engage um, uh, with employers and with the community. So um, if you, it'd be great, well, we have a former teacher right here. I am too, but anything you want to add to that in terms of how we develop soft skills with our kids? Sure. Um, I think that's what, one of the things that I love and is beautiful about CTE is we're giving our students actual opportunity to practice those soft skills. Um, we're not just talking about them, but we're providing opportunities to put those into practice in a low stake environment where it's okay to fail, it's okay to learn and to um, practice your craft and become better at it. And so we're, we're creating an open learning space for students to learn from others, to learn from our community partners and from themselves and their peers um, before we're asking them to go out into the workforce or before we're asking them to go on to higher education. We're really giving them those opportunities in the classroom starting in kindergarten. Um, to practice what we want them to be able to do. 
questions. So if I can just add a comment. Um, one of the things that really attracted me to Western was its education model. Um, you know, having come from an institution that's a land grant, and this is not a value judgment on institutions, they're just different missions. A land grant, primarily in engineering and ag school uh, as its root, was very different from the education model here at Western. You may or may not know that, for example, when a student apply uh, to Western, they are not admitted to a major until their junior year. Now, we lose some students in that process who want to come, for example, directly to computer science, so you pick the discipline you want to. But I think that the nice thing about the model is that the first two years we can really focus on the type of skills you're talking about, the liberal education core that in the long term is so critical um, for our students, not just as, as productive um, uh, uh, employees wherever they go, but really as effective citizens for the state. Uh, and in terms of how they, they really look at history and how they look at culture and how they look at um, innovation and 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 um, developing those uh, those uh, the teamwork and soft skills that are absolutely essential. So I think we um, I'm really proud of the model we have um, at at Western. Again, of course, there's always room for improvement. Um, I'm sure that not all 15,000 students get the same level of attention and skills, um, and certainly we can do better from that regard. But overall, I think that the, and, and this has nothing to do with, with my presence here or anything. This is something that the faculty developed over a long period of time, and really all the credit goes to them for really instituting that at Western. All right, thank you all. Uh, and again, part of this, and I shortened it to try and squeeze out a little bit more time, uh, was, one of the soft skills about being on time. And considering it is 10.02 <laughs> and we had a commitment to end by 10, um, I am going to ask uh, if we could get a little bit of more of your time over the next week or so and I will email you these questions sure. and we get responses and we'll email them out for all the attendees. Does that work for everybody? That's so awesome. sorry for that we couldn't get to everything. But, we get to lean into innovation and really important topics about like some innovation and solar tech, uh, student choice, uh, talking a little bit about student debt, uh, and going a little bit more into enrollment and demographic cliffs. So really good information that I want to get access to all of you, but again, being on time is important too. So how about one more round of applause for our panel? Thank you. Yeah. So please, thank you. And again, I'm going to comment. I really like that tie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Better get him one. Thanks, Thank guys. you. So uh, before we close, I, I think it's important to mention that these institutions are not just the core educational facilities or some of our core educational facilities in our community and in our region. They're also some of our biggest employers. And so the uniqueness uh, that we experience in Whatcom County uh, it's just important to acknowledge. So, a couple other things. Um, again, this is not an official chamber stance or goal, but it's something that I have been pondering over a number of years. And you've heard three incredible speakers talk about it. And I love data, right? So I love information. And what if, what if we were to be so bold as a community to say, you know what, we want 100% kindergarten readiness. And we want 100% uh, third grade reading and math skills. And we want to get up to that 100% graduation rate. Yeah, there's a budget conversation there. We're not going to have that this morning. Uh, but from an ethos and perspective of community, what would that look like? So again, just kind of some parting thoughts. Uh, we also want to <clears throat> acknowledge some of the programmatic pieces that we do as an organization that lean into education. So right over here, you can see one of our banners, Whatcom Young Professionals, is that direct connection in that post-education system where we can catch our graduates from any one of our higher education institutions, but also those K-12 folks that are going into professions, we have that opportunity as a chamber. Uh, next up, we have our 
Communities Comprehensive Leadership Development Program, an education class, if you will. We've got a couple of this year's cohorts in the room, and I want to make a special shout out to Wacom Community Foundation for funding our scholarships this year. So Sarah, thank you so much for you and your team's support on that. And Dr. Baker mentioned a really critical program that most people don't know about in our community is Community Transitions. And we don't have a banner up uh, for that, but, and most of you know my affinity for acronyms, um, IDAC, because in an Intellectual Developmental Disability Advisory Committee is, is a lot of words and a lot of syllables, so we often say IDAC, uh, to where we as a business community can connect with the community transitions and all of those wonderful humans uh, that may have a different perspective on life. Uh, that make great employees, especially in a workforce crisis. So trying to do our part to kind of deepen that connection in this community as well. And then also, you don't have to leave them on the little cards. You can email Sarah or myself. Um, this is the final Chamber Speaker Series of 2024. We're in that weird time where my brain is jumping to 2025. So as we plan for 2025, are there other speaker series that you want to hear? and engage with. So got ideas? Let us know with that. Thank you for being here. Thanks to Veritas, our sponsor, Lydia. Sir, thank you. And I want to make a shout out to our team, Sarah. Thank you so much for making the event flawless. So have a wonderful rest of your day and thanks for being here.